Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 35 of Ah, Real Stories. Today we have three stories of the Let's Not Meet variety for you. So, without any further ado, let's get started. First of all, this is my first post and I am from a Spanish-speaking country, so my English can be a little rough at times. So about 12 years ago, I was 9 years old and I was home alone with my 12-year-old brother. We were supposed to go to my aunt's house to have lunch and wait for my mother there. We always did that because we were too young to stay at home alone, according to my mom. We got up at 10.30 a.m., I took a shower, and then my brother did. After that, we were both in the bathroom brushing our teeth and finishing up getting ready when we heard someone knocking on our door. Since every time someone knocked at our door, they turned out to be a salesman or Jehovah's Witness, we kind of waited for them to just go away. After a couple of minutes, I wanted to see if they were still outside through the window, and no one was there. What a relief. We continued getting ready, and we saw a shadow go by the bathroom window which was kind of like a small square made with that kind of glass that makes everything behind it really blurry. We waited and saw a hand hit it, clear as day. We got scared. We didn't know what to do. My brother had his cell phone, so he immediately called the police. While it was ringing, we heard a loud bang at the door. Someone was trying to brute force it open. I don't know if they were kicking it or ramming it, but it was one of the most frightening things I've ever heard. My brother told me to lock the bathroom door, so I did. It took five bangs so the perpetrator could finally bash open the door. Then the police answered. I remembered the exact thing my brother said. He was whispering. His voice could barely be heard. Hello? There is someone in our house. I think they are stealing. We are at our address. I'm with my little brother locked in our bathroom. Please hurry. While listening to all of that, I was sitting against the wall, hugging my knees. It was one of the most nerve wracking experiences ever. I could hear the man going through all of our stuff emptying stands, going up and down the stairs, opening cabinets. He even broke a few cups and plates. I don't know why. Then I heard the sound that my cell phone makes when it turns off and remembered leaving it on the kitchen table. I felt so stupid for leaving it there. Things continued for a couple of minutes. Then we heard him trying to open the bathroom door. My brother got a hold of a big metal rod we had laying around there. He started kicking the door. Who was there? The man screamed. We said nothing. Another kick, then another. I felt like I was about to have an anxiety attack. My chest started to ache. I had chills and then got really hot. I tried to remain calm, but it was just too much. After that, he stopped. We heard the door opening and then silence. We waited for almost 10 minutes before going out of the bathroom. The living room was a total mess. Lots of papers and books on the floor. The cabinets were open, cups and plates on the floor as well. In our mother's bedroom, The nightstand and the closet were open and everything inside was all over the place. Upstairs in our room, it was the same thing. In about five minutes, the man was able to go through everything we had and left a total mess. After that, my brother called my mom and she ordered us to go to my aunt's ASAP, so we did. When we got there, I was a little more relaxed. My aunt was waiting for us with ice cream, probably because my mom told her everything we had went through and she wanted to calm us down a bit. We went back home at about five o'clock. My mom told her boss that she had a home emergency, so she left early. She tidied up the house, cleaned up, and left everything the way it was before so we could be relaxed. I really appreciate her and my aunt's effort to calm us down and do everything so we didn't have to think about it. According to my mom, the police got home after she arrived at five o'clock, four hours after the incident. She explained everything, but because of lack of evidence, nothing could be done. The man was never caught, and honestly, I don't think they even tried to search for him. The next day, my mom was at home with us. Now I tell the story as a funny anecdote. Luckily, no one was hurt, and he only got useless stuff. But at the time, I was really scared. To a nine-year-old, an experience like that can have serious repercussions. I'm lucky it never came to that, and I got over that incident a couple of weeks later. So yeah, that is my story. Wow, pretty insane story. And to be nine years old during a break-in, that's 
really traumatizing. Also, these cops taking four hours is insane. So great job, cops, at not doing your job. Our author goes on to say in another comment about the post that the country actually had protests about the police labor and how they were always super late whenever responding to situations. But they did say that things are a lot better now, but at the time, things were known to be very slow. Like if you were calling the cops, people knew that they would probably not show up for a while. So not good. But in this story, they're at home with their brother who's 12 and they're getting ready to go to their aunt's house. So they're in the bathroom, just brushing their teeth, finishing up getting ready. And they hear a bang on their door, but they have one of those windows where things look blurry. And it's funny because that is how they look. And I don't know what those windows are called or what that style is, but I knew exactly what they were talking about when they said it, because they used to have windows like that, I think at my parents' house. So a hand smacks the window in the bathroom, which is already very scary. And then they hear this person repeatedly bang on their door. You would think that, you know, it would just be the loud bangs and nobody's home and they leave. But this guy manages to break the door open. So I'm assuming that he was kicking it and that that's what those loud noises were coming from the door. But this guy goes through their stuff, typical break in, makes a mess. It's hard to tell what he was actually looking for. I think just valuable. So it's possible that they were maybe an addict because I know that there's a lot of people with substance abuse issues will just rob houses in search of valuables to then go trade in for money for drugs, especially if there's no real thing. Like if the house is just a total mess, they're going through the cabinets and everything. They're looking for any valuables because people don't really keep money in their cabinets. So it's not really a practical place to look, but I don't know, just a theory, but Definitely very scary for the author to be super young and have this happen because as we talked about before, your home is your safe place. Like it feels like that's your protection from the outside world. So when that is vandalized or people break in, it really takes a long time to recover from that because if you're not safe in your home, you know, where can you be safe? It sounded like their aunt and their mom were taking good care of them afterwards they cleaned up the house to try and, you know, like get the image and the scenario out of their head and they got them ice cream. So kids love ice cream. So I'm sure that helped a little bit. And hopefully the positive memory of that ice cream can help to replace a bit of that negative memory. But definitely a very scary story. I would not want to be in that situation. Not that young. I would be scared to intervene. Now, try and break into my place and see what happens. We'll be right back with more creepy stories after this word from today's sponsor, BetterHelp. Hey guys, it's really hard to go through life if something is weighing you down mentally. For years, I tried to get through life while suffering from anxiety and thinking that everything was normal. I just thought that this is just how I feel. And you know, it was pretty miserable. However, once I finally talked to a professional about it and I was able to get help, I'm doing so much better now. Honestly, it's a game changer. So if you think you might be feeling stressed, depressed, anxious, or overwhelmed, Today's sponsor, BetterHelp, is here to help you. BetterHelp offers licensed therapists who are trained to listen and help you. And you can talk to your therapist in an online environment at your convenience. There is a broad range of expertise in BetterHelp's network of 20,000 therapists that give you access to help that may not be available in your area. You simply fill out a questionnaire to help assess your specific needs, and then you can get matched to a therapist in as little as 48 hours. You can then schedule video and phone sessions and exchange unlimited messages with your therapist. You can request a new therapist at no additional charge at any time. So join the 3 million plus people who have taken charge of their mental health with an experienced BetterHelp therapist. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com 
slash real stories. That's better H E L P dot com slash real stories. All one word. There's no time like the present to get your mental health in order and it will vastly improve the quality of your life. Trust me. Now let's get back to the show. Long time lurker, first time poster. All names in this story have been changed for privacy. For some context, I live in a major city and currently don't do a lot of driving due to the ongoing issues with my car. Plus, the pandemic has made me turn more to delivery apps in general. So, the other day around 1 p.m., I decided to order some lunch after doing a lot of cleaning. I placed the Uber Eats order and found something to watch while I waited for the food. Within a few minutes, a driver accepted the order, and I noticed right away that the driver, Anthony, was on a bike, didn't have a profile picture, or any deliveries on record. At first, I wasn't alarmed at all. I was almost amused, like, oh wow, I guess I'm this person's first customer. But then a full 30 minutes passes with no driver movement on the app, and at this point, I think maybe something is glitching out or this driver is stuck. I contact support via the chat option, and they ended up assigning a new driver because they couldn't reach the first one. Odd, but whatever. Now is when it starts getting a little weirder. The new driver assigned is in the exact same spot as the original driver was. They are also on a bike, and also have no profile picture, and no prior deliveries as well, and this driver's name was Lori. I let another 20 minutes pass with no driver movement before I message them myself and say, Hi there, are you having any issues with the order? The app shows that the driver saw the message, but I got no response. At this time, I'm checking to see if Uber Eats is maybe experiencing issues, but there were none that I could find. And at this point, I'm definitely weirded out. I'm mostly just hungry, so I contact support again to request some assistance. They reassign the driver again and apologize for the inconvenience. Same deal, they also tried to contact the driver with no response. Finally, the third driver assigned is the exact same scenario. Same spot, on a bike, no profile picture, no prior deliveries. Only this time, the name is Robert. And before I can react and go about canceling the order at this point because I'm tired of dealing with this, he suddenly has my food and immediately messages me the following. Hello, have your food. What's your phone number? And I responded right away with, I'm not super comfortable giving my phone number out when you can just message me here. And he responded again with, what's your number? Be there in 10, how old are you? And at this point, the alarm bells are going off and I contact support immediately to have the order canceled and get further assistance. I get connected to Uber's safety team who informs me that the order has been canceled, I'll be refunded and started taking down the details of the strange interactions. As I'm giving the woman on the phone the info she needs, I'm starting to calm down, thinking that this was just some creep or something, and that's when I hear a man's voice at the front door. Miss Metal Gear 4 2069, I have your food. And I can't even describe the chill that went down my spine because of the way he said it. Making things even worse, the Uber safety woman on the phone with me heard him and goes, is that him? We canceled the order. I poked my head around the corner, and the main heavy door was open, but the metal door was closed and locked, but allowed us to see each other. I got a look at him, and when he saw me on the phone, he went from smiling to looking furious. He suddenly got right up against the door and kept asking who I was on the phone with. And at this point, I started asking him to please leave because he's making me uncomfortable and he's getting more and more angry. And at this point, starts pounding on my door and grabbing the doorknob while shouting to be let in. The woman on the phone is asking if I'm okay. The man is still shouting, so I'm basically in full meltdown mode at this point, and I hurriedly close the heavy door to lock it. The man is becoming borderline belligerent as he kicks my door and the woman tells me to call the police. He ended up walking away from my house about a minute after that and back up to the sidewalk, and for a moment I thought he was gone, so I finished my conversation with the Uber safety woman so she could submit the report. Once she submitted it, I called the police and told them what happened. They weren't incredibly helpful at first since he actually didn't break in or put his hands on me. And they told me that if he comes back to call again and they would send an officer out. 
I did end up having to call them again and give a full report and a description of the man since he didn't end up leaving right away. He stayed in the neighborhood for almost 20 minutes. According to one of my neighbors, after she heard the yelling, she saw the man I described walk back up from my house to the sidewalk and hop into a truck with another man in the passenger seat. And they apparently just sat there staring at people walking by and being incredibly sketchy. And that's when she walked back towards my house and asked me what happened. Luckily, she was able to give myself and a cop a description of the vehicle and the other man as well. So basically, this was a very bizarre and uncomfortable experience, and I wanted to share it to maybe see if anybody else has ever experienced anything like this. Because honestly, I'm still pretty shaken up and will be avoiding delivery apps for quite a while. So strange Uber Eats driver who asked me for personal info and then proceeded to try and break in, please, let's not meet. Oh man, that is definitely a very uncomfortable experience to have to deal with. And as somebody who uses a lot of the main food delivery apps, that one particularly just gives me the creeps. So in this story, our poor author is just trying to get some food after doing a lot of cleaning. And they proceed to use Uber Eats to try and place an order. So they get a driver, but they're on a bicycle, and they have no profile pictures or any deliveries on their record. So at first, you know, our author is not discouraged by this because everybody has their first order at some point in their Uber Eats delivery history. So they don't think too much about it. But half an hour goes by and there's no movement because on these apps, if you've somehow never used them before, you can track the progress of the delivery driver. Like you'll see them go to the restaurant and then you'll see them on their way to you to drop off the food. So if a half an hour had went by with nothing, I would be frustrated more than like creeped out. But she contacts Uber support and they just assign her a new driver and they're like, sorry for the inconvenience. But then the same thing happens again, but with a different name. This person on a bike, no picture, no delivery history, not moving. That's strange. For that to happen twice in a row, like, what are the odds? So they talk to Uber Eats support again and request another driver. So they reassign the driver again, and the same thing happens a third time. And before they can go and cancel the order, the person messages them because your driver can message you and you them. And they're like, hey, have your food. What's your number? And they're like, why are you asking me for my number? And they're not comfortable with that. So they tell them that. And the person's like, how old are you? Just like, no, dude, like you're so creepy at this. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Just deliver the food and get out of here. So they then contact Uber's safety team which Uber's really stepped up their safety to be fair to them. Like if you're in an actual Uber, not an Uber Eats, and you're in the car, if the driver like goes off course, they like text you and are like, hey, are you okay? Is everything good? And if you don't respond or whatever, they like contact the police. So they've really stepped it up, which is good because there have been, you know, some horror stories about people trying to get home after like a night out on the town drinking and maybe they're taken advantage of by some horrible driver. So good thing that they cracked down on that and made it a lot safer. But in this case, our, our author is on the phone with the safety team when this driver comes up to her door and she has like a door that she can see through and then one that's like locked. So she can see the guy, but he could also see her. And he says to her, hey, I have your food in a really creepy way that makes her very uncomfortable. And he sounded like kind of like, you know, jovial, upbeat or whatever. But when he sees that she's on the phone with somebody, he's immediately upset and the vibe changes and if I had to guess why that is, I would say it's because this person now has a potential witness to whatever weird thing they were planning on doing because they were clearly trying to get more information out of her. 
and we find out later that there's another guy in the truck. So this really could have turned out weird. So luckily, they don't get in because that door is locked, which is, again, why it's always important to keep your doors locked. But he was like pounding on the door and grabbing the doorknob and shouting at her to be let in. So she's freaking out. But luckily, she was on the phone with the Uber Eats safety person. So they were there to comfort her. And after like a minute of him freaking out and banging on the door, he leaves for a little bit. And so she tries to call the police, who in our second story in a row are remarkably unhelpful. So great job. And they basically said he didn't actually break in or put his hands on her. So nothing they can do. But that's like, you know how like attempted murder is a crime? Shouldn't attempted break-ins be a crime as well? Because luckily they weren't able to do what they were planning on it. But you don't know what they were planning to do. But it sounds like they were trying to break in. And she didn't want them there. So that sounds like it should be a crime to me. But hey, what do I know? Luckily, one of their neighbors hears all this commotion and kind of goes outside and gets a full look at the guy and sees that he just goes away and enters a truck with another guy, which is really weird because that's what makes me think that they were planning something really nefarious. So luckily she gets the description of them and is able to contact the police who finally decide to do something and they were canvassing the area and looking for him. They don't really give a follow-up as to if they were ever caught or whatever. Hopefully because they have the vehicle description, something was able to be done. But also in the comments, a good tip is anytime something happens when you're at home and someone's at your door acting sketchy, you want to make them believe that you're not there alone. So they say to pull a home alone movie stunt. A great thing to do is act like you're with your significant other or like a husband, boyfriend, even your dad. And just like yell like, hey, dad, could you come here for a minute? Or something like, hey, so-and-so, our order is here. Can you get the door? Because that lets, I'm not going to lie, that would help you out. Because that lets whatever creep know that you may as well have somebody in your house. And they're far less likely to do something if there's another witness who could probably fend them off if you're unable to. So it's definitely a smart move, and I would very much recommend that. But I'm glad that she didn't have to find out what their true intentions were, but it sounds like it was something bad. So definitely be careful with these delivery apps and these rideshare apps, because even though they've made it safer, it's not a sure thing. So just be careful. Alright, I spent my entire slow day at work yesterday reading through this sub, so now I want to share my little story. My childhood best friend Marie and I were around 11 or 12 years old at this time. Marie's family had their own campsite in a provincial park about two hours from our hometown and would spend the entire summer each year living in the camper out there. This particular summer, I was able to go and stay with them for a week, and we were excited to spend time adventuring around the forest. On the last night that I was there, we decided we wanted to hurry down to the ice cream shop by the lake before it closed. It was early evening at this point, still pretty bright out, but beginning to lose light. The path we took was down a short slope next to the main road with maybe 10 feet of thick brush and trees in between. On the other side was the forest with more tall, thick brush. So we were walking along, not a single other person in the path in front of us. We hear a sudden rustling and snapping of branches, similar to the sound of maybe a similar to the sound of maybe a deer moving through the woods. I wouldn't have thought anything of it, but then the sound of running footsteps follows. Marie glances back and suddenly grabs my arm, urging me under her breath not to look back. At the same time, the running stops. I don't know why I didn't ignore her and get a look myself. I guess I could sense a very real fear in her voice and chose to listen. We both start to panic, getting that feeling like when you're running up the stairs after turning the basement light off. We pick up speed as much as we can without breaking into a sprint, knowing the ice cream shop is only about a minute walk away from this point. The path soon breaks and we are in the parking lot. Suddenly, Marie steers me hard to the left, heading towards the lake and the boat rental instead of continuing straight to the ice cream shop. 
and I go along with it, silently, understanding ice cream is no longer an interest right now. Marie is clearly panicking at this point. We are both looking around, but it seems whatever scared her is nowhere in sight at this point. Marie walks up to the boat rental and gets us a kayak, and we climb in and begin to paddle out into the middle of the lake. As we paddle, she tells me that there was a man behind us, and that the man had stopped running at us very abruptly upon making eye contact with her. He had been wearing a long black coat with the hood up despite it being the middle of July, and had a terrible smirk on his face, and she swore that as he stopped running, she saw him put something shiny away into his coat. He appeared to have emerged out of the bushes after we walked past, given the sounds that we heard right before he came running onto the path. We reach the center of the lake and stop paddling. I pull out my Nokia brick phone that my parents had, thank God, given me for just in case. I hand it to Marie and tell her to call her parents and to come pick us up. As the phone rings, I see her look out past me to the shore and go pale. Lifting a hand to point what she is seeing, I turned and there was the man, stalking his way around the path that circled the edge of the lake, staring at us. We sat in the middle of the lake and watched him do two full laps never looking away from us before finally disappearing. It took a few tries to get a hold of her family. We were freaking out so bad the whole time as the sun got lower and lower. We did manage to have someone come with the truck, but by the time we reached the shore, it was pretty dark outside. I don't know what we would have done if we hadn't been able to call for a ride. Looking back, I don't know why we didn't just go up to the ice cream shop and inform an adult there and ask her parents to come and get us then. But it worked out. We got back safe. And we thankfully never saw the man again. Wow, that was a scary story for sure. You'd think that just trying to go get ice cream is such like a safe and innocent thing for two little girls to go do. And they can't even do that peacefully without some creep trying to do who knows what, but definitely something bad to them. So our author and her friend are off at this campsite that her friend's family stays at during the summertime. And down the path from where they're at is an ice cream shop. So they decide to go and get some ice cream. You know, it's been a long day, it's a hot summer day. What perfect time to get ice cream. So they're walking along this path to the ice cream shop and they hear a sudden rustling of snapping branches, just like standard sounds that you always hear in the woods, probably made by some creature. Her friend Marie, thank goodness, looks back and sees this guy, and he apparently was dressed in black and had something in his hands, something shiny, most likely a knife. Marie kind of takes charge of the situation, grabs her hand, and they take off. Our author actually didn't look back as she was instructed not to by her friend. So she didn't get a good look at her possible stalker, possible future criminal, which is unfortunate because as scary as it is to look back and see that somebody's following you, you do want to have a description. So it's better to kind of look back. But they're kids. I don't expect them to know that. I'm just telling you, the listener. Um, <laughs> so she then steers them a hard left, heading towards this lake and this boat rental, where instead of notifying an adult about the situation, they rent a kayak and decide to go kayak in the lake, which I guess does get them away from this person, but is not necessarily the best thing to do. But again, they're kids, you gotta give them a pass. However, it is at this point after they are paddling in this kayak that they decide that we need to call this girl's parents. So they do that and it is after this that our author finally does see the guy and he is wearing a long black coat with the hood up, despite it being the middle of July. So, you know, he is trying to avoid detection. He is trying to avoid being seen. Very scary. And he had a terrible smirk on his face, which is just very menacing. It just reminds you of a lot of scary shows or movies or whatever. Not something that you want to see, especially when you're two young people in a path. Imagine just walking in the woods or in a park or whatever, you hear some rustling, you think maybe it's a deer or a rabbit or something, and just a guy just comes out of the woods and he's following you, dressed not appropriately for the weather, definitely looks like he's trying to hide himself, and he's following you with something shiny in his hand and a smirk on his face. Like, those are the stuff of nightmares right there. They were able to get away 
unconventionally, but you know, it did the job. They made it out, so you can't really fault him too much. And they said that while they were looking at him when they were in the kayak and he was still on land, that they watched him do two full laps around where they just were, and he never looked away from them. So very scary guy. I don't know what his problem was, but thank goodness they were able to get away. And they say looking back, they should have just went to the ice cream shop and informed an adult there, which not gonna lie, they should have done that, but hey, it's okay. But yeah, if you ever have an encounter such as this, definitely report it because you never know what crimes may have been reported in the area and this can help stop repeat offenders. So if that ever happens to you, please tell somebody because you don't want somebody else to go through what you just went through. Alrighty guys, that's going to do it for episode 35 of Ah, Real Stories. This week you have heard Hooded Man in the Woods by Flowers for Boys. Then, Uber Eats driver possibly using multiple accounts tried to break into my home upon arriving by Metal Gear 4 2069. And finally, I hid in my bathroom in the midst of a home invasion when I was nine years old by Happy Ghost Pogs. All stories were read with the permission of their respective authors, and if you have a story that you would like to hear on the show, please email it to me at the ARS podcast at gmail.com. That's T H E A R S podcast at gmail.com, and you can remain anonymous. Also, before we go, I loved hearing that we have listeners overseas. So I just want to give a shout out to our listeners in Puerto Rico, Poland, the Philippines, Morocco, United Arab Emirates, Peru, Kingdom of Jordan, Mexico, Israel, Czech Republic, Austria, Malaysia, Denmark, Australia, Brazil, Netherlands, India, Ireland, Germany, France, the United Kingdom, Italy, Saudi Arabia, and Canada. Thank you so much for listening. It is so cool that we have people listening in other countries. And continue to spread the word. Tell a friend and leave a review. And I hope you guys have a great week. And I will see you next time with a brand new episode. Stay safe.